When I built my solar generator, I didn't do the necessary homework and the unit had challenges. When I started to see problems, I hit the books, and I also had a lot of excellent advice from viewers with their own knowledge and experience. The resulting improvements gave me a unit that perfectly meets my goals and should do so reliably for years to come. To help you build your own perfect solar generator, I've gathered everything you need to know into a couple of documents, a design worksheet and a wiring diagram, and I'll walk you through them in this video. I've posted them online so you can plan out your own generator project. To really build a good solar generator, you need to do some design engineering, consider the pros and cons of various options, and do some math to ensure the unit will perfectly suit your needs. I've built all of this into the design worksheet, so it's all done for you when you plan out your own project. If I had this sheet when I began the project, I'd have saved hundreds, and the generator would have been perfect from day one. In this video, I'll share my experiences and challenges so you know what's important to consider, then introduce you to the design worksheet and the wiring diagram, and then walk you through them. I've left links in the description so you can download the documents. When I started my project, I picked components with big specs and figured I'd be well beyond the modest needs I'd planned to cover. I used my fabrication skills to assemble a sturdy and well-wired unit, but I failed to apply any of my engineering education or mathematical skills. This resulted in my unit being woefully inadequate for the task I'd chosen as a real-world test, keeping a small fridge operating off-grid for a winter month when it would be most challenging. I wanted to learn everything I could during the testing, and so I used a lot of test gear to see exactly what was happening. I connected a recording digital multimeter to a laptop, and it logged the battery voltage every 100 seconds for the whole month. I set up a process to transfer the voltage logs onto a database server, and wrote queries to summarize the data and chart the results in Excel. I checked the waveform from the inverter to ensure it really was producing a sine wave, and I used a Hall Effect current meter to find out how much current was flowing between the panels, the charge controller, the battery, and the inverter. I also attached a power meter to the inverter output to measure and record the load the unit was supporting. In the beginning, I had a dull sense something was wrong with my original diverter choice. I went back and checked the specs and found it was actually a modified sine wave unit, which my scope confirmed wasn't good for inductive loads such as motors or compressors. Like in my fridge, I upgraded to a pure sine wave model, which was only $40 more, and got me higher surge capacity. Then I destroyed the battery. It was killed when cloudy days discharged it below its 50% recommended minimum charge level. In fact, it discharged to about 10%. With lead-acid batteries, even so-called deep cycle units, doing this will damage the battery, severely reducing battery capacity. After repeating this on a couple more cloudy days, the battery was kaput. It wouldn't store enough energy to support the load for more than a few hours. In the comments, viewers suggested upgrading to a different and better type of battery, either AGM or lithium iron phosphate, commonly referred to as LifePo. The original Group 27 Deep Cycle Marine battery cost about $90, an AGM equivalent cost about $300, and the LifePo around $900. I couldn't wrap my mind around spending more than the total cost of the generator project just for an upgraded battery, so I went with the AGM. Right away this was a significant improvement. It handled the charge-discharge cycle well and supported the load throughout the night. However, when I analyzed the voltage I could see the battery charge level was gradually dropping day by day. I analyzed the battery charge discharge cycle, and the math showed that the energy stored in daily solar charging wasn't quite enough to offset the daily discharge to support the load. This was a little surprising because the energy from the panels, 200 watts for 6 hours, or 1200 watt hours, seemed like more than enough to support the load, 27 watts for 24 hours, or 648 watt hours. I expected inefficiencies, but not like this. After doing some research, I found three major efficiency factors that really affect the performance of a generator. Number one is the efficiency of the charge controller. That affects how much of the energy coming from the solar panels is converted into charging power for the battery. The inexpensive unit that came with the solar kit was a PWM type, which is about 70% efficient. So about 30% of the panel wattage is lost. Number two is the battery round trip efficiency, or how much energy you can get out of the battery for the energy you put in charging it. For the original deep cycle marine battery, the rate is about 75%, so another 25% of the energy was lost in the battery charge discharge cycle. Number three is the inverter efficiency, or how much 120 volt energy comes out of the inverter compared to how much 12 volt energy goes into it. The upgraded inverter is about 87% efficient, so another 13% is lost there. Using the components I'd originally selected, I could only get about 91 watts of usable AC power for 200 watts of solar panel production, for about 45% energy throughput. This was shocking and reinforced how important the advice in the comments was. Viewers suggested using different types of charge controller and battery, and this can make quite a difference. 
Upgrading to a more expensive MPPT type charge controller and an AGM battery changes the overall efficiency to 72.5%, a whopping 60% increase in usable power from the same panels. You can get more power by adding more panels, but that can be a lot more expensive than just upgrading components. Okay, now let's get to the design worksheet and the wiring diagram. I've posted the design worksheet online so you can use it to develop your own design. There's a downloadable Excel sheet or a rough online version that should work with most devices. The links are in the description below. The best way to design the generator is to work back from the load to the source. Once you've downloaded the sheet, there are four or five steps you'll go through. Step one, inventory your devices. Step two, calculate inverter size and run current. Step three, determine battery capacity requirement. Step four, calculate charging power requirement. And step five, optionally calculate backup generator requirement. So you start with an inventory of the devices that you'll be running on the generator. Enter the list of your devices in the table in the upper left hand corner. I put some examples in here for you to work from. In my case, I have a small fridge, two phones that I'll be charging, two tablets. I also have spaces for LED lights, a TV or audio system, and a CPAP machine. These are items that people have mentioned in the comments. I have the quantity set to zero on these items because I'm not planning on having them as part of my load. For most items, it's pretty easy to figure out the load they represent. You can simply read the wattage off of the label and have a pretty good idea of how much power they require. Some items, however, run on a duty cycle. That means they don't run all the time. They turn on and off throughout the day. Those are a little bit more difficult to calculate. I have an inexpensive power meter that I plugged the fridge into, and then I ran it for several days, and then took the kilowatt hour consumption and the number of hours it was measuring, and put them into the box on the right. According to the meter, my fridge consumed 2.57 kilowatt hours across 96 hours of running. That's 27 watts per hour. And I plugged the 27 watt number back up into the main table. Throughout the sheet, wherever there's numbers that you'll need to enter, they'll be highlighted in yellow. In all cases, there will already be a number there, which may be a good representation of the numbers you need to use. So assuming the numbers in yellow are good enough, there's nothing to do in step two. In step three, you'll determine the battery capacity that you'll need to support the load. First, plug in the number of days of autonomy that you expect to support with the generator. This is the number of days in a row that you expect the generator to support the load without the benefit of the sun to charge the battery. The system will tell you what amp hour reserve you will need for the battery in your design. You'll need to choose one or more batteries that add up to at least this number. When you've made your decision about how many batteries you have and what their capacity is, you can add up the amp hour reserve and plug it into this box. In stage four, you'll choose your battery capacity and what kind of can charge controller and enter in the amount of sun hours that you expect in the shortest day of the winter. Choose a battery type from the first table, take its efficiency percentage and plug it into the first yellow box. Then choose the charge controller type that you intend to use, the less expensive PWM or the more expensive MPPT controllers. This decision will have a big impact on the efficiency of the generator and how much hardware that you'll need to support your load. Finally, plug in the minimum number of full sun hours that you'll have in the shortest day of the winter. For users in the US, I provided a US daily solar hours chart on a second tab. The chart has about 100 major cities listed so choose the low number from the city closest to you. In my case, the closest major city is Phoenix. Outside the US, you won't have much trouble finding a chart suitable for your locale. Just check the internet, it'll only take you a few minutes in Google. The calculator will let you know how much power you'll need from your solar panels, so you'll need to buy panels that add up to at least this number. Once you've chosen your panels, plug in the total wattage and the nominal operating voltage of the panels into the last two boxes in step four. The final optional step is to calculate how much backup generator you'll need if you're planning on using a generator to charge the battery on days when you don't have sun. Plug in the battery charge voltage, 13 and half volts is pretty normal, and the battery charge current. My small generator has a 12 volt charging socket that supplies about seven amps. If I'm using my large generator, I plug in a bench battery charger, which supplies about 15 amps for charging. Finally, plug in the fuel consumption of your generator in gallons per hour, and the system will tell you how much gasoline it will take to charge your battery on a rainy day. At the bottom of the sheet, you'll get the major specifications for your generator. The first item is the minimum inverter wattage. In my case, I need a 934 watts peak to support my load. That means a 1000 watt inverter should do the job. Secondly, I'll need 150 amp hour reserve in the batteries to support the load through normal operation and one day of autonomy. Minimum solar panel wattage at 375 tells me that I really ought to have 400 watts of solar panels since they come in 100 watt increments. The system energy throughput or efficiency is 51.8% of the design choices I've made. This number will vary from a low of about 45% all the way up to nearly 75% depending on the choices that you make in the sheet. Of course, a higher number means that more solar energy will support the load 
and you'll need less equipment to do it. Finally, there's a projected available daily load power. This is the total number of watt hours available from the system as designed to support any combination of loads. So that's it for the design sheet. In just a few minutes, you can plug in enough numbers to get a good idea of what your solar generator will be capable of and what kind of equipment you will need to build it. Okay, so that brings us to the wiring diagram. This diagram shows all the components of the system and shows how they're connected together. So let's just touch on a few of the components. Starting on the left side, there's a battery maintainer. This is part of my project because the generator sits mostly in my garage, standing by in case I need to take power someplace remote or if the grid goes down. Since it may not be connected to panels at all, the battery maintainer keeps the battery fully charged so it's ready to go whenever I need it. At the top is a small battery discharge monitor, which is incredibly useful to get an accurate picture of what the battery voltage is. Watch this panel closely and make sure that you never discharge your battery below the specified minimum for the battery type, otherwise you'll severely shorten the life of the battery. Below that is the 12-volt panel. This panel has two USB charging ports, a 12-volt cigarette lighter adapter, a voltage display, and a switch that turns everything in the panel on and off. One of the reasons the 12-volt panel is so important is because the USB ports are connected directly to the battery. This means you can charge phones and other USB devices without losing power to the inefficiency of the inverter. It also gives you a great place to connect 12-volt loads directly, like a spotlight or something else that would normally plug into a car cigarette lighter port. To the right is the inverter, and to the right of that is a power strip. With the power strip, you can plug in up to six more AC devices, although you have to be cognizant of the load and make sure that you keep it down. With this particular power strip, it allows four more USB ports. Since there's also a USB port on the inverter itself, there are seven USB ports on this system, so I can provide charging for a number of people at a remote event. Next on the left are the solar panels, and we'll discuss those more later. To the right of that is the charge controller. This is the device that connects the solar panels to your system and provides charging for the batteries. To the right of that is a fuse block to make sure that the system is adequately protected. The top fuse at 3 amps supports the USB ports and the voltage meters. The 5 amp fuse is for the battery maintainer and protects it against shorts in the system. The 20 amp fuse powers the cigarette lighter port. And finally the 30 amp fuse is from the charge controller to the battery. In the lower left are pictures of three items that are very important for the solar panel feed. The first is a 30 amp fuse that protects the solar panels from shorts in the system. The second is a heavy 10 gauge automotive disconnect so you can disconnect the panels from the generator. Finally, there's a picture to remind you to put a strain relief on the wire that goes to the solar panels. This will prevent the wires from being pulled out of the charge controller should somebody trip over them. Finally, there's your battery or batteries which you would wire in parallel if you have more than one. Well, what do you think? What have I missed or what did I get wrong? I'd like to know, so please leave your comments below. I try to respond to every comment, and I'm sure I'll learn a lot from your experience and perspectives. For the engineering types, I've made the sheet mathematics easy to follow, so you'll see exactly what the calculations are. If you find any errors or have suggestions for elements I've overlooked, I'd be especially pleased to hear from you. I'll update the worksheet with the best of the feedback, so be sure to come back and get the latest version in the days to come. This design can have a lot of uses. Some of the most interesting from the viewer comments are, off-grid power for camping or your cabin, upgrading the power system in your RV, a power center for remote ham radio events, portable AC power for church or musical events in remote locations, or emergency preparedness for grid down situations. Well, thanks for watching. Please like and save the video and share it with others that might be interested in the topic. And don't forget to subscribe because there are a number of new videos in the works and you won't want to miss them. As always, be safe.